Hey guys, this is Steve Guttenberg here, and today's show is, well, taken from last weekend live at Expona with Steve and Herb Riker, and we had the best time. But here's the thing, I want you to stick around to the end of today's show because there is a big surprise, big for everybody, including me and her. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this, the goings on as much as we did. Let's get to it. You are ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Ladies We're and ready. gentlemen, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised to see all the ladies in the audience. I, I, I know they both have groupies. So, you know, Herb Riker, Steve Guttenberg, I have no idea what they're going to do. And Neither do we, really. No, you do. I kind of do. That's what these are. We're ready? So, I got to start with this question. Are you guys audiophiles? And if you are, clap. I want to know. There you go. My people. You're right. We're here. You're right. And you're an audiophile, right? Yes. Because sometimes you're iffy. On no, that. I got to make this really, really clear. When yeah. I started at Stereophile, I wrote a piece and I showed it to Steve before I showed it to my editor. And he said, Herb, you got to be, be an audiophile. And uh, I said, really? I'm not an audiophile. And then he said, you can't do this. So I became an audiophile that day. I talked him into it. But you know, the thing, it's interesting because when I sold Hi-Fi for a living, people would wander into the store who you know, weren't audiophiles, and I'd sit them in a chair and I'd play a nice system for them. And I would say, let's say three quarters of those people, it, it didn't do anything for them. It was like, yeah, it's okay, you know. But the other quarter were like, this is amazing, right? My point is that even people, not, not everyone has it in them to be an audiophile. You know, it's, it's not everybody's taste. So you people are very special. So you can give yourself an applause. And before I forget, I do want to thank, if my patrons are in the audience, please applaud yourselves. There you go. That's pretty good. That's nice. A couple of years ago, I did a story about I wanted to put together a really great 1970s, mid-1970s system and play mostly mid-1970s recordings. And I did this at Stair Exchange, a store in New York City, and it was with Tannoy Ardens with a 15-inch concentric driver. It was made in 1976, and a really big audio research amp, like a 150 or something, and an SP3A, and a garage turntable, and a modern cartridge. I didn't do the 1970s cartridge. But anyway, I'm listening to this mid-1970s system, and I'm thinking, this sounds really good, in many ways better than a contemporary system. So this, well, now would be 48-year-old system. It's like, yeah, they knew how to make really great sounding audio in 1976. In many ways, better than most contemporary order because the thing about that system was that it, well, it had this giant 15-inch concentric driver, but it had soul. I like to use this word soul, and I listen to con really good contemporary stuff, and it has less. It's more analytical, you know, con good contemporary audio is more transparent, it images better, the bass is tighter, it's faster, it's clearer, it's all of those things. But in terms of hearing music, do, do those things really matter? I think it depends on the person who's doing the listening, and it depends on the kind of music you're listening to. But for many, it might not be better. Now the thing is, I find it kind of tricky to talk about buying vintage audio because it's like buying a 50-year-old car. You know, it's probably not going to be in the best shape. So it's not an easy road to go down. Depends on the condition, obviously, and the person who's selling it to you and all. There's a lot of qualifiers to it. But where possible, I mean, what I'm saying here is, to you, as consumers of high-end audio or audio, maybe chasing ever greater transparency and clarity and all the stuff that modern things do, maybe that's not the answer, you know? I mean, the, like the... the uh, Purity or Project Duet 15 that I use as a reference, it's not the fastest, it's not the clearest, it's not the most transparent speaker. But here's the thing, it's got this secret weapon, 
well, A, it's an open baffle speaker, it's not a box speaker, and it has a 15 inch woofer. And I'm telling you, and I've said it in reviews, living with a 15 inch woofer or a 12, mm -hmm. it's different than listening to a little two way stand mount speaker with a five or six inch woofer. It's not the same thing. And in terms of communicating scale and size like a grand piano, I'm telling you, I don't, I've never heard a stand mount speaker, sorry to put it down, uh, a small stand mount speaker that's, that can make a piano sound in terms of its scale, it just it can't do it, it's too small. So yeah, size really does matter. What do you think, Herb? Well, it's funny. It, the question is more, what am I thinking about while you're talking? Okay, whatever. But the, it's interesting. I'm thinking of the people Are you out thinking, here. Wait, Guttenberg, where did you go, man? No, 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 no. I, I, I talked to Steve no less than an hour a day, six days Very a week. Very long conversations. Way longer than this. Sometimes twice a day. And that doesn't include my tray. But what I learned is that... No, I forgot what I learned. Oh, no. <laughs> I hate when that happens. No, 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 wait. This is important. Okay, this is really important. When you go to these rooms, I see reviewers doing it. I see, I see exhibitors. Now, I've exhibited more than I've attended audio shows in my life in terms of total number. And what you don't understand is people will go, oh, well, it, you can't get good sound at an audio show, or it's going to be, it, blame it on the room, and, and all. I'm sitting in these rooms today and yesterday. These are better rooms than you have. I mean, the walls really? are really thick. They're totally soundproof. They don't move. The floor is concrete. And we were in a room, or not you and me, but I was in a room, and the person I was with said, oh, this speaker, you know, it, it has boomy bass. And then we went for, to another room. In this case, it was the Catalano High Water Sound Room. And he had more 15-inch woofers. And he had more, he was moving more bass air by a huge margin. Mm. And the guy said, see, look how clean and tight this space is. I said, look, it's exactly the same room. These are, I mean, how many people out here, we're gonna take a plot, how many people got a better room than the ones that are upstairs? Yeah, that's a good question. See, nobody's wait, applauding. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Gonna, Maybe two or three. Gonna, I mean, these are good, solid rooms that are just like real people have. Wait a minute, I object. So, <laughs> throughout my life as an audiophile, when I would go to a show as a civilian, let's say, and I would come home, and I'd hear all that stuff, and I'd sit there in my chair and listen to my system, I'd say, it's pretty good, even when it even wasn't pretty good, because my system represented my taste, the ability of, to put it together and pay for it, right? So my system was me, and the systems that I heard at shows or other people's places wasn't me. It didn't align with what I wanted out of it, right? So my system, yeah, maybe here and there, oh, that system I heard the show was way better than I've ever had. Sure, that happens, but I'm saying in mass, in total, my system is usually better than what I heard. So yeah, what about you guys? No, wait, I want to vouch for that. <laughs> and, it, and the price is very low. I'll come home from this show, like many of you. The first thing I'm going to do is put my stereo on. There you go. And relax. Right, I and just threw my suitcase wait, I'm on. I'm testing if you're really an audiophile. Are you going to play some of the same music you heard here over your system? Of course. OK, so Absolutely. you are an audiophile. No, no, no. Okay. No, 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 absolutely. But I, I'm, I'm curious if you guys clap if you think when you get home, your stuff is, it's really pretty good. Is that true? It should sound See? Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. All right. And that's the big point, really. Right. The hardest thing to do, and I, I mean this as an artist, not as an audio reviewer, is to be yourself and to trust your own judgment. I mean, it sounds easy. You know, you can put it up on a mem or do anything you want. But to actually do it, to be who, like, I'm old, I'm genuine old. I'm actually what they call close to the end old. And you know what? I'm really, I like the person I turned out to be. And holy, that's like really, no, that's a really hard thing to do. Man. It's the thing I'm the most pleased about. It's just, what else do you got? You're gonna get old. You might as well turn out to be the person you want it to be. Anyhow, blah, blah, blah. I just want to tease you with this. It's something that I've been working on for a little while now. And the idea 
that when you are listening to a great sounding recording, in your opinion, and let's say it's a studio recording, you are listening back through time to when those people made that music and they were in a studio together and they were listening to each other and they were in the act of really creating something magical that, let's say it was 50 years ago, 50 years later, you're at home listening to that and you were hearing through time back to that session. Now there's a lot of qualifiers in that idea, but it's, it's sort of like a mind trip that you let yourself go with that illusion. It's true to, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, but to some, some of that DNA is in the recording. So it's not just the sound of you know, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, it's that you're listening to the Beatles making it, it, here's the thing, in real time, real time to them, right? And here we are all these years later, whatever it is, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, they were in a studio, they were creating something that's so meaningful that people 50 years later are still, you know, getting off on it. And I used to be a movie theater projectionist. And when you're watching movies, you're at, and you love the movie and you're involved in it, you're the characters and the story, you never think there are people over there, you know, acting out this scene. It's that illusion can never be that complete. But with recorded music at its best, that's what you get. And I just ama I'm still amazed that that's even possible, especially with a record with, as they used to say, pulling a rock down a dirty road, that a stylist <laughs> tracing a groove can create sound that's that real to people. And that's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. What do you think, Herb? You know, <laughs> well, you know it's, it's funny. I'm listening to a lot of old recordings, like acoustic recordings, mm -hmm. not with an acoustic player, of course, but I'm listening 78. to 78s, but even more. I'm listening to digital remasters of like old players. And there was a machine called the Presto, and it was one of the first electric recordings. And all they did is put a microphone up, and there's about six feet of wire, and there's a little amplifier, and they're cutting a disc with wax on it directly. When you play these things back today, recordings made from them, even remastered ones, it's scary how real they are. And the noise is like that far back. And I mention this because not only is it real sounding, but it takes you right there. Mm. I mean, even when you hear like the Robert Johnson recordings and they're really clear, and then you have in your mind a picture mm. of the room that right. he did it in right. and the hallway going up to it, which mm. was, we're, we're talking a really like weird, dingy, right. like weird, dingy place. And you're there. Right. I mean, that's good. I get goosebumps just talking about it. Anyhow, that, yeah, that's, is that what you mean? That's it. Before Harry Pearson at the Absolute Sound talked about soundstage, People talked about stereo imaging, which was basically a flat line between the left and right speakers. That was the stereo image. But when Harry talked about soundstage and a sense of depth and space and the relationship of the musicians relative to each other in a recording, when he pointed it out, other people heard it. <coughs> Everyone could have heard it all along, and I'm sure they didn't, but just didn't connect the dots. But once Harry made it, you know, put it down in print, other people not only heard it, they started listening for it. The ones that didn't hear it started really listening for it and got really excited about what that meant because that was kind of a way of talking about what I'm talking about, about listening back through time to people making music. And that is incredible. But it's the words. And now transparency is another word that I think Harry coined. And that one is a little harder to pin down. But my definition, and I think other people disagree, my definition of transparency is a version of that that through the speakers and the wires and all the electronics at your end and the record electronics and microphones used at the session, we're listening to all of that stuff and we can hear it like there's no stuff between us and them. I mean, do you have a different definition of transparency? I picture, you know, when you were a kid and you saw those cartoons where there's a man in a control room up in your skull running the game? 
I always, and I mean this, I always picture I'm a little person inside that ribbon microphone looking out into the room. Okay. And that's actually what you hear. Right. That really is what you're hearing. Uh -huh. You know, it may get all kind of dusty on the way to your place, but <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, you're still, you're a little person looking out through the microphone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was this great, um, Thing that Walter Sear, Sear Sound, this amazing recording studio in New York City, and he recorded everybody. And I did an interview with Walter Sear for Stereophile maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And you walk into his studio, and there was a sign hanging up right above the reception desk, and it said, Recorded sound sucks. We're trying to make it better. He didn't have gold records on the wall, although there were plenty of gold records or platinum records that were recorded in his studio. But he was like, we are trying to do this thing and make music. I mean, he, first of all, he did this incredibly uh, amusing thing that he never name dropped. When he referred to somebody famous like Paul McCartney, he called him that bass player from England. And he, and he called uh, Jeff Tweedy the weepy guy because he, would, he cried a lot at sessions because he, he just was a very emotional state when he was making records. And he called Bruce Springsteen, the guy from New Jersey. It was really funny. You're a good listener. What? You're a good listener. That's a, actually, that, when I wake up in the morning, that is my goal in life, when I wake up. But I do want to remind you, we were going to talk about whatever it was about learning to listen, speaking of, yeah. by trying different things. Oh, right, right. You do that. I'm just, OK. So. One of the things Steve and I talk about a lot we talk is a lot. like how, like if you're a beginning audiophile, there's really not much chance you actually know what you're listening to any more than the average person on the street. And over the years, I mean, I've always had someone mentoring me, like say, Herb, I mean, and I think as an audiophile, if, if I get to see all you guys out there, my, my first thought is like, try anything. And this is what me and Steve are doing. They're, you know, it's like the only qualification you and I have for being up here is we've heard a million things. Right, that's true. And it's really hard to do that. The average person living in the average place can't just go out and hear giant Altec horns or, I mean, all the weird stuff. And so my advice to all, and this is what I think we together have wanted to do, was to impress on people that you can't find what you're not looking for, which is an old herbism, but the idea that you don't know what you're looking for until you tried that thing you didn't think you liked. Think of it as dating. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious. And then finally you find that irrational thing, person that you want to settle down with, and you didn't even know that you liked that kind of person. How many times has that happened to anybody? You know, you're surprised. It's not the person I thought I was, you know, casting bait to achieve. And at the end of the day, that's how you find your audio equipment, right? Right. So, in other words, if you've only listened to digital and you've never even tried analog, maybe you should, you know, unless you're outright hated or something. You gotta try the other thing. If you've only lived with solid state, you should live with a tube, maybe a tube preamplifier or a tube DAC or something, you know, just to get a taste. Maybe you like it, maybe you won't, but you won't really know until you try it. And just other people's opinions, even mine and Herb's, it's not the main thing. It's your opinion is the only opinion that matters when it comes to picking out your system. And the reality is everybody has to find out that along the way and make mistakes. And one of the things that Herb brought up is that some, some of you, actually uh, uh, applaud if you do this, clap your hands if you do this, that you purposely buy equipment without the intention of keeping it, just to flip it, right? So you, you choose wisely and you buy a, you know, a pair of uh, speakers for $1,000, keep for two months, say, I got this, they sell them, maybe you get most of your money back, and then you buy something else. And that's, that's it, and I think that's a great way to, if you can afford it, if you have the time to do the buying and selling and shipping and all that stuff, it's definitely worth pursuing, especially if you want to speed up the, uh, 
the education curve, and hear as many different types of things as possible. So, do, so how many of you guys do that sort of thing? Wow, well, there you go. That's a significant percentage of you. So we're already doing it. You don't need me to tell you to do it. But anyway. You know, in the art world, when you're selling art, and a young couple will come in and they'll say, well, we'd like to buy some art, but we don't really know that much about art. How should we do it? And they go, buy something you can't afford at all that's way over your price range and that you know nothing about and take it home. He says, and I'll sell it to you. And he says, I promise you, you'll come back in two weeks and you'll know more about it than anybody else on the planet trying to figure out if you overpaid. <laughs> and you know what? There's a lot of, that, that isn't such a bad plan on some level. I mean, when you can, just, you know, I, I'm, a big, I'm a dumpster diver by nature, but I still think everyone should like try where it should, you know? You see, Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a secret of life. Yeah, experiment as and you much learn, as possible. Okay, so you, you get at home and you, you bring home this tuner, for example, or this speaker, and you don't like it. You had to figure out why you don't like it. Before you can sell it, you've just bought this thing. Do I like it? I mean, of course you're asking yourself that. I mean, that's my thing with subwoofers. If I get a subwoofer, now I'm closing my eyes and I'm trying to dream, but I'm still looking for where the subwoofer is. My left brain wants to come in and point at it. That's how you learn to do that stuff. You buy that. $500 turntable and see how it sounds, just for fun. Actually, actually, somebody came up to me at the show yet yeah, today, actually, and said that he bought the least expensive Fluence turntable, the RT81, which I think is $249 for, I think for his daughter. And uh, he's, he was amazed, and I'm continuously amazed, how good that turntable is for $249. So there's affordable ways to get into, really affordable ways to get into turntables, or go to the used market, but that's a whole different story. That's what I paid for my CD player, by the way. Right, the $249 <laughs> CD player. And I'm gonna compare it to the new T-Act in the next month. This is a rhetorical question. Is it cheating to use really good quality recordings? This is kind of goading you. Is it cheating to use really good quality recordings to evaluate a hi-fi as opposed to average, or depending on your taste and genre, crappy recordings? No. What do you think? No, that's only three people that said no. <laughs> that's wrong. Right. It's cheating not to do both. Okay, okay. That's easy. That's too easy an answer. That. I don't accept that. But no, of course, of course you should. But the thing about really bad recordings, it doesn't matter if they're not, let's say, audiophile. And I don't like when people use that word to describe audiophiles, oh, audiophile recordings as a group, right? As a group of recordings, right? Um, because to me, and I have a biased perspective, I admit this, an audiophile recording is one that was made to capture the sound of the instruments and singers in the room as, as closely as they possibly could. All other recordings, everybody else, which is the other 99.9999% of recordings, those recordings were made with the desires of the band and the producer and the engineer to create a sound that did not sound like they actually did. I asked a couple of engineers about recording the sound of singers. What do singers say to you when you're putting a microphone in front of their face? And without exception, they always said, make me sound better than I really am. You don't have to capture the real me. And the drummer would say, make me sound bigger and more powerful than I really am. And the bass player would say, I want to hear every note. You know, they'd all not want to sound like if you were actually there standing in front of them. And I think, so that proves my point, so to speak, patting myself on the back, that listening to an average recording and expecting it to sound lifelike or real or all that stuff, that's a harder thing to pull off because that was not the intention of the people making the record. And I just crossed my mind, I'm kind of contradicting what I said like 20 minutes ago. But make believe you didn't hear what I said before, at least for this part. But ultimately, the, set, the, the system only has to sound good to you. And whatever I think or Herb thinks is not really very important. So, 
Um, no, I want to, I'm going to interrupt. Oh, I'm, good. I'm going to disagree with that. You're going to disagree and with that? I'm going to disagree. And the reason is, and this is not, I mean, no one I, I know personally, other than maybe Mike Trey, has heard more hi-fi systems than Steve. So he's been doing this since, like, you know, before the golden age of hi-fi even. That counts for a lot. And I think people, when you're looking at other online reviewers or whatever, I think you always have to ask yourself at the beginning, before you can kind of like, two things. What is their vocabulary? And number two, what is their experience with that vocabulary? So we're the best. No, but tech, you talked about Harry Pearson at the beginning. Mm. I've literally gone through his work and I knew him. And it was like, I've put a highlight all the, all the adjectives and descriptors, and then analyze that. And I really believe, and it, you guys have to go along with it, because you need to learn, all of us learn a vocabulary. And that vocabulary needs to evolve with the culture, I believe, of audio. And I think it is our job, I, I think of it as my job, to evolve that vocabulary and to take you guys with so that we can communicate on the next level, the future. Mm. And that's what Harry did. I mean, I learned to listen with him and my friends. That's the voice of God you just did there. Right, but what I'm saying is, is my friends are taught me, and I've had mentors. And I mean, I still, I use heavily use mentors. And that's the difference between, you know, the whole group of us, group of us, moving and forward and, and, and evolving together, like a couple. Anyhow, blah, blah, blah. That's the herb view on that. All right. You've saved your piece. OK. So I have advice for all of you. And that is, you know, you decide for yourself, obviously, but before you buy the next thing, the next uh, piece of audio equipment, take a breath. What is it that you really want? Because your system as it stands right now, for most of you, is actually pretty good, right? So before you go into this next thing, maybe what you need to do is uh, broaden your musical horizons, you know? Maybe you need to, you know, different genres of music or even the music that you're into, let's say it's, it's a certain period of rock music, you know, go back 20 years earlier and see what that was like. Um, because maybe you're just bored, you know, you're looking for a new drug, and maybe instead of spending money on an amplifier, you just really put time into finding other kinds of music. And the great thing is now, with streaming and everything on the internet, it doesn't cost you anything. You used to, you used to have to spend money to explore different genres. Now it's free, and you just do it all the time. And I listened to this uh, public radio station in France called FIP used to be easier to get through whatever it is, the platforms that stream internet radio stations, but you could just, you know, type FIP and you can do it directly from FIP because they have uh, no commercials, it's, it's public radio, the announcers are speaking in French, but they have long sets and they have different uh, stations. They have Eclectic, which is the one I listen to, but they have rock, they have jazz, they have hip-hop, they have reggae, they have these different genres, but the eclectic one is extremely eclectic. It can mix Iggy Pop with opera, you know, it doesn't matter, it can jump from anywhere to anywhere, and I'm constantly, you know, what was that? And I see what it is, and I write it down, and then I go find that music on Spotify or Tidal, or Cobuzz, and I listen to it for a while and see if it works for me. But I, I, the point is, I'm an old guy. He's a little bit older than me. But uh, I'm always looking for new music. And you know, electronic music has always been a tough one for me because it lacks soul. But in a way, if you get into it deep enough, you start to feel the, 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 you know, the, the hand that guided this musician, uh, this music. So it does have soul. It's just not in the fingertips. But um, yeah, look, look deeper into your, you know, your music collection, because that's what, you know, some people say they listen to a hi-fi to hear the music, or the music to hear the hi-fi, all that kind of stuff, which is true, you know, 
but it's 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 almost like they're trying to guilt trip you about oh you only care about the sound or whatever. I love sound. It's like yeah, the no, thing that I'm, drives I'm gonna me. I'm double this. I mean, people go, oh, they just buy equipment to listen to their you know records to listen to their hi-fi. So what? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Yeah. I mean, that. sound is a pretty amazing thing. Right now, if we were silent, just yeah. hearing this room. The rumble of the room, yeah. Mm. The subwoofer. Subwoofer. You know, yeah, but yeah. you learn, no, there's a lot more going on too. But I mean, it's really interesting to learn to listen. Mm. And sound is fine. You don't have to understand the music. I mean, I think good music is really hard to understand. So, you, you know, the sound gets you in. It's the doorway in. You know, yeah. it's kind of like the good outfitter, the, you know. <laughs> it's why violinists want to have Stravat, Strat, Stravatian. Say it for me, huh? Right. Stradivarius. Um, because they care about the sound of their instrument. So I got one of the things, since we're rounding the bend here, and while Herb was talking about the experience of a reviewer, I'm, I want to find more younger audio reviewers on YouTube or on websites or, or magazines. Because, of course, if you're in your 20s or 30s, you have a completely different perspective than me and her. And I want to hear more from those people. And by far, my favorite young reviewer is Jay, and I can't pronounce his name correctly, Yagi. Yeah. He has a fantastic YouTube channel. And his, his growth as an audiophile and making videos is, is amazing. I don't even think he's 30 years old, but he has a lot of experience. He worked in a store, uh, Audio Excellence, he's, he's Canadian. He did installations, he did repairs, he's heard a lot of stuff. He told me once where he said by the time he was 25, he had 60 pairs of, he had owned 60 pairs of speakers that he flipped through. So he had a lot of knowledge. He was like me, <laughs> although I didn't, when I was 25, I didn't have 60 pairs of speakers at that point. But He's the best one. But if you guys have any suggestions out there as to other really good, uh, however we want to do it. it. Actually, for order reviewers, if you're under 50, you're definitely young. So 20s, that's really pushing it. But if they're out there, I want to find them. That's my, one of my goals. So you can email me, those people, and tell me about them uh, with, uh, at uh, audiophiliac at mail.com. The thing about audiophiliac at mail.com, it gets a lot of emails and I don't necessarily see them all because there's too many when I'm actually looking for something. But anyway, give it a shot. I, I really want to know. I'm not kidding around. I want to find uh, this next generation of, uh, of reviewers. Right? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he told me the time. By the way, I have an answer to how do we get more uh, young audiophiles interested. You, all of you, it's your job to pick one, to make one, to grow new audiophiles, mentor people, because you have, let's say, the equipment. <laughs> you already have the equipment to, it's not going to work all the time, as I said earlier, not everybody hears it or gets it, but you have good stuff, because you're here, and you find somebody you know, a friend, a neighbor, a relative or something, and say, check this out. Ask them to bring their music and hear it on your system. So if every one of you guys created one new audio file, next year I'd be talking to twice as many people. So there you go. So at that point, we need to curtail things because... Listen to that voice. Yeah, He doesn't need a That's microphone. a serious voice. Because we have a... Jesus. <laughs> We have a little presentation. Hello, back there. Come on. Who's coming forward? To uh oh. Us something. So, uh -oh. between these two gentlemen, uh -oh. watch we the tripods. Have, yeah. <laughs> we have oh my lord. 150 years of experience. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> We, we are together 150 years old, so wait, wait, there's more. Live music is the important thing, oh. so sing. Sing. Uh, no. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy oh. birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Herbert Steve. Steve.
Perfect. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Put that in You'll notice we didn't do that. <laughs> right, we're going to cut into 400 pieces. Part. Oh, I don't care. Yeah. we got to take a picture it's, before we mess it up. It's, no. I'm not going to mess it up. <laughs> well, we don't have a knife. We're just going to... I have no idea what we're doing. Do this. <laughs> anyway, that's the... Thank you, everybody. Presentation. Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to talk, we can talk out there after, or we can talk here. Thank you. <laughs> but we need to take a picture. <laughs>